Okay, I decided that before tearing the system down, I'd get joysticks and low-res graphics working. Joystick unlocks many games. I've also got low-res graphics working, and I replaced the 22V10 PLD with 8 ICs. The design now uses zero PLDs. We'll see how big it ends up on the PCB. Oh, come on. Anyone know of any other Apple II games that used two controllers simultaneously? Okay, here's a quick walkthrough about uh, how the joystick works and uh, what I've discovered. Apple II joystick is kind of crazy. It's an analog joystick, so when the C070 soft switch is fired by reading or writing to the address, it charges up two capacitors in the attached joysticks. This charge causes C064 for X axes on joystick 1 and C065 for Y axes on joystick 1 to start reporting bit 7 as a 1. The joystick has two variable resistors attached to the stick, so the stick position on each axis determines the resistance for that axis and thus how fast the capacitor will dissipate the charge held by the capacitor. Joystick position on each axis is determined roughly by tracking how long it takes for bit 7 to go from a 1 to a 0. The time is measured by counting the number of clock cycles. This is one of the reasons that the Apple couldn't just increase the clock speed in the Apple II. The joysticks would stop working. Joystick number 2 uses C066 and C067 for the X and Y axes and works the same way. The ROM has routines for reading the joystick position, but many games just have their own code for doing this. Games like Choplifter use the ROM routines, whereas Boulder Dash has written their own. Reading is tricky because C070 charges all of the capacitors in all attached joysticks, so counting to figure out when each axis bit flips is tricky. Because of this, the ROM routine strobes the joysticks and measures one axis of one of the joysticks at a time. To check two joysticks, it would require four strobes, four times counting to figure out where the joystick is on each of the queried axes. This is probably why games wrote their own routines. An interesting side effect is that the position of your joystick actually determines how long the processor has to work. If you're moving to the right or down, it will actually slow down the game a bit. C061, C062, and C063 are the three supported buttons. These are digital. Bit 7 means that the button is actuated. For some reason, the Apple II supports two controllers, but only three buttons. Can someone explain that one to me? Now let's take a look at the SNES gamepad. SNES uh, joystick is much different. SNES is digital. Either a D-pad direction is pressed or it isn't. This limits the mapping between the SNES controller and the Apple II joystick to eight directions of neutral. Apple II can support approximately 255 positions on both the X and the Y axes. When converted to digital, this becomes three positions on each axis for nine total positions. This works fine for many games, but some games do use the rich axis data. More on this later. The SNES joystick has five active pins, power, ground, clock, latch, and data. Clock and latch are driven by the host, CPU, and data is driven by the controller. I like this much better than the PS2, where the device manages the clock. When the CPU manages the clock, querying the controller can happen in a tight loop, as opposed to having to wait for the device. The controller contains two 8-bit shift registers connected together. When the host latches, the state of the buttons are latched, and the data pin contains the first of 16 values. The host can then read the first value and then toggle the clock 16 times to get the state of the other buttons with every clock cycle. Okay, so how to get the SNES controllers to work on a system that expects analog joysticks. Uh, I use the VIA. The way this works is the clock, latch, and data pins are connected to PB7, PB6, and PB5. This could be any of the VIA port pins. Uh, the second joystick can share the latch and the clock signals, and controller 2 data goes to PB4. This is pretty cool. First joystick takes three pins, but each additional joystick only requires one more pin. Could easily support four joysticks with a single VIA port. C070 is the signal that the system is using to indicate that it wants to capture a joystick measurement. As such, the signal can be used to capture a snapshot of the buttons. I've hooked up the C070 signal to CB2 on the VIA and have configured the VIA to fire an interrupt on the falling edge of that signal. Now when the program reads or writes C070, the interrupt fires. The VIA has two timers which can be programmed as one shot and they count down for each CPU clock cycle. I modified the soft switch area to act as RAM. This enables me to write uh, to the values C061 through C067 in an interrupt handler as if it were coming from the hardware. This is completely different from how the Apple II implements this. 
In the interrupt handle, I check the IFR register to see if it's the CB2 interrupt, and if so, I toggle the latch, causing the current controller state to be stored in the shift registers. I then read the first value from both controllers by reading from the via ports, then toggle the clock 16 times, reading from the data pins each time. This gives me the state of each button on both controllers. I stash the button state for both controllers in CEE0 through CEFF. The interrupt routine then starts two timers. This could easily be cut down to a single timer. Using both timers is a luxury. The two timers, T2 and T1, T2 is set to the number of cycles to the halfway point. When the interrupt fires, the button states are cached, and if the left or upper pressed, the bits are flipped in the corresponding addresses immediately. When the midpoint timer fires, if the right or down button are not pressed, we flip the bits at the midpoint. At the end timer, all virtual capacitors are virtually discharged by setting bit 7 to 0. This means either far right or far down. Here's a little test program I wrote. It just sits in a tight loop calling C070, prints out the controller state for both controllers. There are some limitations with this approach. Some games rely on the full range of positions on the X and Y axes. To handle this, I'm thinking about implementing support for a PS2 mouse. This way I can keep a virtual mouse position on the X and the Y axes as the mouse is moved. These positions could then be used to determine when the timers terminate. In this way I could get the full range by using a mouse. I've got one pin left on my VIA that supports interrupt and a few more port pins open, so I think I'll give it a try. PS2 mouse seems to have a lot more communication back to the device, so maybe solving mouse will help me add LED support to the keyboard as well. Like I said, I made some changes to the graphics. I broke the PLD out into individual ICs. The PLD has kind of felt like cheating. Also added support for low res graphics, and uh, that'll have to wait for another video. Thanks for watching. I know it's been a little while, but I'm not going to stop. See you next time.